chance, you know, at the end to say whatever you'd like in, in addition to what I, I'm asking you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, for the editor, if you would state your name, the rank at, at which you uh, retired, and where you served. My name is Drew Dix, and retired as a major in uh, Special Forces. Retired after 20 years with Special Forces. And you served? In the Army. You were? I mean, yeah. I, 20 years is a lot of places. I, <laughs> uh, I served, in, uh, served in the Army and I served mostly uh, out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina with uh, two tours in Vietnam and, and uh, uh, one tour in, uh, in Alaska where I retired in 1982. Where were you born? I was born in West Point, New York. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I lived in uh, Cold Spring. I really oh, yeah. don't know where that is. I mean, I it's left right when I was, the river. yeah, two years old or something. Like I that. gotcha. Okay. Um, so, tell me, um, you know, when you were growing up, where did you grow up? And where were you in high school, et cetera? I grew up in Pueblo, Colorado, and uh, graduated from high school there in 1962, and, and and joined the army when I was 17 and a half. What made you decide to? I enlisted in the Army because um, uh, my father had been in the Army. Uh, I was one of these individuals that went to ROTC in high school. Uh, there was an active duty sergeant that was on the ROTC cadre that I learned to respect and, and had a lot of respect for. And, and I knew that uh, between my, the influence of my father and this, this sergeant that I was going to go in the Army. When I, I was not aware of Vietnam when I enlisted. I enlisted in 1962. Vietnam was, was going on at that time, since 1959, but uh, I enlisted in the Army to go into Special Forces and found out I had to be 21 years old before they would take me in, in those days. And uh, so I went to the 82nd, cooling my heels there a bit until I became 21. And, and uh, in 1965, um, I went to the Dominican Republic with the 82nd Airborne Division. They had a, a small conflict down there that lasted a few days. And that was my, I guess, the first chance I got, first time I got shot at. But uh, then soon after that, I went into Special Forces. And at that time, when we were in the Dominican Republic in 1965, was when the first major units went to Vietnam. And that's when Vietnam became more aware to all of us when the first CAV went over and some of the first 173rd went over. When you were uh, first in your first engagement in the Dominican Republic, uh, did you feel you were trained for that? My first engagement to combat, uh, I was a young paratrooper in the 82nd. Uh, uh, I was highly motivated like the rest of us. Uh, we were anxious, and that's what young soldiers do, you know, we were, were anxious to get involved in something. Uh, I felt I was trained um, to, uh, to, get in, to get into combat. So tell me, uh, when did you, when were you shipped off to Vietnam? When I, I was shipped off to Vietnam in 1967. And uh, I said that I had to wait till I was 21. Well, to get to be trained in special forces takes quite a bit of time. The war was going hot and heavy when I got into special forces, and I thought it was just going to pass me up. Uh, but I, uh, but I went to uh, special forces. The training was some, just about a year long, and I started language school, and that was almost well, that was six months. And in 1967, I just knew that the war was going to be over, at least for Special Forces, and, uh, and I was somewhat concerned because I was ready. That's what all my um, 
instructors, uh, the older sergeants were talking about. I wanted to be a part of it. And uh, I went over to be on a Special Forces A team in Vietnam in October of 67. And, and what were your uh, main objectives as part of that team? My main objectives to go to Vietnam was to be on an A team. This 12-man A team is the, uh, the ultimate combat unit in Special Forces at the time. And when I got to Vietnam, I was somewhat disappointed because in, in, uh, when I arrived at Cameron Bay, uh, I was singled out and pulled off of the normal um, rotation cycle to the Special Forces headquarters in the Trang. And uh, I knew then that I wasn't going to see action with Special Forces. I was going to be sent off to Saigon to some support unit or something. And, and after two days I re waiting, uh, I did get a call and they sent a plane up and took me to Saigon and I started getting briefings on a special project uh, working for a civilian agency in uh, the Fourth Corps region, southern part of Vietnam. This was the CIA? Yes. Uh, I was working uh, for the CIA, a, a program that was a counter-terrorist counter program initially um, to, to organize, train, and lead indigenous troops to go after uh, 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 communist or Viet Cong uh, infrastructure. That was my mission after I got reassigned uh, in Vietnam. Let's move forward to, to the actions that uh, took place that led up here. Um, now tell me a little bit about, about um, what, the, what your initial mission was and what happened after that. The initial mission that I was on uh, just prior to the Medal of Honor action, uh, I'll have to just, just explain a little bit. I was in the intelligence gathering business. Uh, intelligence. Uh, and I was in an armed intelligence unit, which means I collected the intelligence and I acted on my own intelligence. So, and to capture individuals was my primary mission. In 1968 was uh, the, the New Year, the Chinese New Year was fast coming. And at that time of the war, the U.S. government and the Allies and the end of the, the communists were trying to find every reason to have a ceasefire. We, for political reasons, to back out a little bit, I think, and the communists to give them more time to ceasefire to get organized and do more what they were going to do. So when uh, the word came down that there would be a ceasefire for, I believe, three days, I, I don't remember totally now, uh, I knew that that something wasn't right. My business was intelligence. I knew the area of where we were operating. And so I had just come back from a patrol and there was an, uh, this complete absence of enemy action along the Cambodian border and in Cambodia. So I knew something was up. And I, I talked to my boss um, at the time and I said, you know, uh, I've got to go back out and see what's going on. The, the ceasefire disturbed me, um, and I was working kind of unilaterally on my own. I could do what I needed to do. I didn't, wasn't going to violate the ceasefire, but I w could go out and, and conduct a reconnaissance. And at the time, a Navy SEAL platoon was in, that came into our area looking for some action, and they hadn't had a lot, and they heard that we were, could give them some action. and. Uh, so they volunteered and went with me to the border to see if uh, what was going to go on. And uh, so we put together a, a patrol and went up near the border and got into a minor skirmish. Just when we were trying to um, uh, determine where our support was going to come from if we got into a heavy, heavy battle, uh, I got on the radio and found out that Chow Duck was was uh, under attack. So we uh, headed back to see what we could do to, to help relieve that pressure. 
uh, it was clear then that the enemy were already where they wanted to be is why I wasn't seeing any. They, they, they performed a magnificent, clever infiltration in all these, these cities. That was their best shot at the time up until that. They were going to win the war at that time, I believe. And um, around the country, you know, we responded so well, the Allies then just, just, just uh, foiled their attempt and really hit them hard. And uh, I think at that time is when the war was clearly could have been won. Um, now, you were in Chowduck for how long before, before this action? I was in Chowduck four months before the action. Okay, so you were familiar with the, the city pretty well? I was very familiar with the city. Uh, in the four months that I was there, I was familiar with the countryside. I, I felt like I really knew where I was and, and the, the structure of the enemy as well as um, the, the local uh, indigenous troops. To get the, the proper perspective, um, that part of Vietnam didn't have any American troops other than a few special forces units. We were totally uh, relying on the, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And there weren't that many of them down there uh, in the, the Delta. Okay. And uh, you were working uh, with how many people in the city at that time? I was working, I had a unit that had about 100 and, if I recall, 137 men in it. Uh, our mission was to cover the entire province of Chow Duc, five districts. And I did that with, with uh, troops spread out all over in little cells gathering information and then I would act on the information that uh, they would collect. And because of that, I didn't have 137 people with me. Uh, and on the patrol that I was on, I only had, if I recall, uh, four or five, four, four, and then the Navy SEALs uh, platoon. Uh, and because there was a ceasefire, even my troops and the Arvin troops were enjoying the ceasefire. They were in town uh, doing, they were on holiday visiting whoever, the family, girlfriends, whatever they were, they were doing at the time. So I didn't have control or access to all of my troops. Uh, I felt good about it because there was a large, I had a nine-member nine SEAL platoon with us. Okay, so, so you, you received word on the radio that they were under attack. Uh, so what happened then? Well, the... Uh, uh, the na the, when we received word that we were under attack, we went to the river and we called the, the Navy uh, PBRs, river boats, the U.S. Navy, and they picked us up and took us right to, to towards Chow Duck. Chow Duck City was located on the confluence of uh, a river system. And we were trying to, I was trying to get information. I knew the, the, the province, I knew the structure of, um, of the, the the indigenous, trying to figure out what was going on. I was, I had got a hold of my boss on the radio at the embassy house and um, found out that things were really bad. They were worse than I thought they would be and that um, some civilians had been uh, killed or captured and uh, uh, Maggie Francott, her, her name at the time, was, was possibly uh, killed and uh, he was very concerned about her, had been in communication with her, and then all of a sudden it stopped. And uh, I was told that she was probably uh, killed or captured, uh, as well as some other Americans. That was the first thing we needed to do, was find out where the other Americans were. And um, most of the, most, well, all of them that we were concerned with were volunteers, uh, civilian volunteers. They, they were, uh, some on the payroll, maybe some not even on a payroll but of sorts, but they were volunteer dedicated to their to helping what was the war effort and uh, the, the locals. And um, so I kind of felt like we need to take care of them. I mean they're they're Americans and most of them and they needed we need to find out what was what was going on, what happened to them. So you, <coughs> you made the decision to go back into the city. Um, 
from what I, I've read, I understand you were um, basically when you went to land uh, that you would get a tenant status. We, we approached the city and I'm rapidly trying to figure out, and the SEALs at that time relinquished uh, the command of that to me clearly because I knew my way around. They didn't know the city at all at the time. And uh, so I, I made the decision to land in the center of downtown rather than go to the embassy house, which was also on the river. We, we could have done that, but I, I wanted to be able to relieve the embassy house, not become a part of that if they were surrounded. And it was better to fight our way in than just to beach right on there and then we would be held up just like they would have been isolated. So we landed on the, on the beach and, and we got quite a bit of fire. Uh, the enemy, at that time, it was clear that they had totally infiltrated the city before they had initiated their attack. I think they thought they were going to fight their way in, but it was far easier than they thought. I mean, everybody was celebrating this holiday. Even the first fireworks were probably, or the, the firefights, people thought they might have been fireworks, if you can, you can imagine that, that scenario. But uh, once we got into the, the, the city, um, the Tactical Operations Center wasn't far from where we landed, uh, the river boats, and we made it there and found out that the t city was totally uh, under control of the, the VC. The local Vietnamese were, were demoralized because they were caught off guard. Uh, the acting province chief was, was who I th think I thought of and think very highly of to this day, was very uh, demoralized because his, he was told his wife and children were probably killed and his uh, best friend and bodyguard uh, was killed and it turned out that he had been. And then next order business was go to, to the embassy house, get some uh, uh, equipment that we needed, vehicles to move around town, and that's where I linked up with my boss, uh, uh, Jim Monroe. So were you picking up troops as you went along? Not a, I wasn't picking up any troops. I had what I, we came in with because the, the town, the, the troops were totally, what the troops were in the city were totally holed up in, to, uh, in different buildings and, and residences. Uh, there was no leadership because they were all on holiday. There, there was no organization of, of leadership. Um, so we, we made it to the embassy house, uh, get a couple of vehicles, and that's when I found out that, uh, uh, and we went, took the vehicles back to the Tactical Operations Center, the Vietnamese headquarters, and found out that um, Maggie, uh, the nurse, was, hadn't been heard from for a while. Uh, her house was not that far from our compound, and I, I said, we need to go uh, check out and see what was happened to Maggie. And that was the beginning of the of taking back Chow Duck. Okay. Well, can you tell me about um, what happened when you went to look for Maggie? We went to look for Maggie uh, at her house right away because we were told that's where she was, and, and there were two vehicles, um, two jeeps, and uh, we we literally uh, raced through the gates of the. Uh, Tactical Operations Center went directly to her house and was receiving quite a bit of fire along the way from the enemy uh, that were positioned in the, the, the tops, the roofs, or the upper story building windows. And uh, I, when I first started out, I, I said, these guys, we're not going to make it through there without s sustaining heavy injuries because they were in fixed positions and windows, and we weren't able to... Uh, stop and engage them, because if we did, we'd get bogged down. We just kept running through their, their positions and pulled up to uh, Maggie's house. And it didn't look good because she had a, an International Scout was her issued vehicle, and there, there could have been a thousand bullet holes in it. The tires were flat, the windows were out. Um, it just kind of sitting there all like it, it had taken a brunt of the ass an assault. And um, there were some trees in front of the, her little compound. The, there was a wall compound, very low wall. And uh, about half the leaves were on the, on the 
the ground on the patio, and uh, that was from the concussion from rounds had been hit the building and, and in, the, in the yard. And it just didn't look good. And uh, uh, the way the, the building, it was an older type, type French structure and there was an iron gate across the, uh, the door that you see in a lot of different uh, countries that they have these, and maybe in the United States. And it was locked and uh, couldn't get in. And I thought, well, maybe you shoot the lock off, but uh, that didn't work. It, it, we didn't try, but it wouldn't have worked. And uh, the enemy had, when I, we approached the building, Jim Monroe and I uh, approached the, the building. The gate was closed, but the door was open. And we saw some enemy run out the back room. There was a front room and then a kitchen, and then the back wall was kind of just blown out where they had done that in order so that the, they could move from block to block without going down roads. They, it's a very common tactic I first saw in the Dominican Republic where you can stay off the roads by going through the, the, the buildings, the walls. And uh, so these two, two, I believe, ran out the back door. There might have been more. And I went to the side of the building to make sure they didn't run out and were coming back along the wall, and they hadn't. Uh, we left a couple of the Navy SEALs and, and some of the um, indigenous troops that were with me uh, on the vehicles, and they were uh, suppressing fire. Uh, and they were just on the vehicles making good targets of themselves, and, and I knew that when I'd, we turned around that somebody was going to be hit, but uh, fortunately they weren't. Um, so I'm talking to Jim yelling back and forth. It was a little bit, it was loud there and we're standing right there together at this gate frustrated we can't get in. I'm thinking about going around but there was some enemy back there I know. And, uh, and uh, so I called out, I said to Maggie, you know, and, and uh, nothing at first and then I heard somebody said, yeah, it's me. <laughs> and there was a room in the back of the, um, uh, in the corner of the living room was a door, and I guess that, that's where her bedroom was. And uh, she, she was in there building somewhere. At that time, I didn't know exactly where. And uh, uh, said, Maggie, just come out, you know. And, and, uh, and she did. And she ran up there and they couldn't get the door open because it was locked. And uh, uh, I remember at the time saying, well, get the key. And, and when I looked through, there was a, the, the building was totally in shambles, uh, like they had empty drawers and threw them on the, the middle of the floor uh, looking for things or I don't know, but it was just total shambles. And she turned around and picked up the key and there it was and unlocked it and, and then we got her out. But, uh, very, very fortunate, very lucky. Uh, um, it was uh, kind of felt like things are going to turn out because she wasn't killed. I mean, it was, we really thought she was killed, had been killed, and uh, took her back to the Tactical Operations Center. Now, <clears throat> after that, you, you brought her back to the, the uh, center. And what did you decide? What were you thinking at that point? Well, after, after we uh, secured Maggie and, and got her to the Tactical Operations Center and then later down to the Embassy House and uh, the Navy boats that were there, got her on the boat, um, we were still, I was still concerned about the other civilians. First order of business, we got to find out where the other eight or ten civilians were and their, their situation. So I took uh, some of the Navy SEALs and we got back in those vehicles. We organized, we said, we got to defend this embassy house. So Jim Monroe stayed at the embassy house uh, because it was the only piece of real estate we knew we, we owned and, and we could come back to and operate from if we didn't get cut off, uh, that we could get resupplied or have radio communications to the outside world. We didn't know at the time that the entire country was under attack. We did make some calls and Jim had told me that that he couldn't get through to Canto, our next headquarters, or Saigon, 
and uh, that they were under some kind of attack. But we didn't have the details. But uh, we didn't think about that too long, and we just went back to the, uh, the compound where the civilians were last known to have been and uh, went, went to get them. Were they there, or did they have to search the city? When we, uh, the, we took the two vehicles to go back to find the other civilians, um, we headed to their compound. And the, uh, we, we were receiving quite a bit of fire from rocket propelled grenades. Uh, and they were, you could see out of the corner of your eye, they're scurrying on top of the buildings. We were trying to get a position on us, and we just, we just kept going and uh, pulled up to the, the front of their compound where there were two trailers that, that most of them were living in, maybe all of, all of the ones were living in there. One was totally destroyed and it didn't look good. And I, so I left everybody, uh, the, our small group, uh, the two vehicles and, and a few people to secure those vehicles. I, we had to have those vehicles secured or we weren't gonna get out or we'd be like everybody else. And uh, I ran into the compound to make a quick survey of the situation, ran by the one building that was destroyed and towards another one that wasn't so badly damaged, nobody in there, and then I was hollering and, at, and I, there were two enemy that had peered over the wall and we exchanged some gunfire and they left or fell down back behind the wall, I'm not sure, I didn't, wasn't concerned, and um, there was a bunker there and uh, a voice came out of there and said, it's, we're here, you know, and uh, I said, well, let's go. And uh, one of the guys, I didn't know him well, I just knew that they were there. And one of the guys, the agriculture advisor, uh, I don't remember his full name, I think it was James, uh, and he stuck his head out, a dark, a dark face, you know, stuck his head out and saw me and uh, I said, let's, let's go, and he says, no, there's BC everywhere out there. I said, they're gone, they're coming back, and, and when he heard that coming back, he yelled back into the bunker. I didn't know who was in there with him. He said, Drew says they're coming back, and he wants us to go now, and, and uh, so they all dashed out of there and followed me. And, they, and then we started heading back to the vehicles, and they started feeling like they'd been rescued, and, and they were, they started walking and talking. I said, let's, get, let's go, this place isn't secure. And uh, we took a couple rounds and got in the vehicles and, and we were just heavily loaded. I put them all in one, so, and it was, it was almost comical how heavily, heavily loaded it was, but I needed the maneuverability of the other one. And we, we got them back and really started feeling good about that. And I, and, and I just, to this day, wonder how that slow-moving vehicle, heavily loaded, was able to get through there without, without any anybody hit. That's yeah. <laughs> How did you feel? I mean, um, is it is it training? Is it instinct um, that makes you go back? And and is it what is it that tells you? I mean, you obviously could have stayed at the compound, secured it and not going back out into the streets in, in to put yourself into harm's way. What, what made you decide to go back in? Well, a lot of people ask me why, why we went back in, why I went back in, and, and I guess uh, we started getting a momentum. I started feeling good about what we were accomplishing. Uh, it was clear there was a lot of enemy there, um, and, uh, and we knew the area. I knew the area. Uh, there were still other people after we got the other civilians out. There were still some more that, that were two Filipinos that were last heard that were in, in enemy control. And, and it, didn't, it didn't dawn on me that we were just going to leave them there. Uh, so I wanted to get back. And, and then when things kind of got bad when one of the SEALs was killed, um, yeah, I said, well, we're going to keep moving, and and we got the, the the seal back. He didn't die right away, but he, he died soon. And um, they were ordered not to go back into the city uh, for I don't know what it, what the reasons were, 
there's something about it, we're going to lose all the seals for to snipers, which was not what they wanted to happen. Their commanders. Um, so I went back in with a small group of uh, my provincial reconnaissance unit and uh, started to to have some success. We started then once we the seals were no longer with us and. We had already made enough trips into town that we got a good feel for where the enemy wanted to be and where we needed to be. And then we started having some set success getting the, uh, some off-duty uh, uh, Vietnamese soldiers and a few of mine had seen us. And they started coming out and joining the, the fight and we really started feeling good. I mean, when you have six me and, and six indigenous troops, and all of a sudden you're up to maybe 14 or 15, you feel really good when, when there's, at that time we, we thought there were two enemy battalions, and there was about 600 enemy in this little town. We're going to change, okay. We started having some successes, and, and the indigenous troops that were enjoying the holiday uh, started joining us, uh, it, it, falling in behind us. Uh, we had to be careful because, uh, you know, they jump out of a door or window and, and they all look the same, um, especially when they were not dressed in their military uniform. Uh, they started joining us and, and that's when the, we knew, I knew the enemy had this, the key uh, strong points of the city, the high buildings, the big compounds, uh, and they were holed up in, in those. Um, each time we we took one of those over by having a few of the others that joined us I was able to leave somebody there because if you didn't do that then as soon as you you uh, have the firefight and you take it over and you leave they're gonna come right back it's kinda like they were fighting the whole Vietnam War you know you take a piece of ground and you left and they came back and by then we I knew kinda that strategy and I said we're not gonna fall for that trap so I left one or uh, two or three uh, the, the indigenous troops at every one of those key intersections. Some of them had been wounded and weren't that useful, so we just left them there. I mean, things were bad. I mean, we had to use the wounded. Uh, we weren't getting anybody out. The last time we made a successful evacuation was to get the, the, the mortally wounded seal out, and uh, we, we just couldn't afford that anymore. Every time we made a trip, through the, the main compact, the main highway, uh, not highway, but main street, next to the, between the hospital and the Bossack River, uh, we just knew they were going to have an ambush for us because we had set up a pattern, something I don't like to do. And they even knew you were coming when you got through some of that. Well, I had to hear that Jeep screaming around uh, the streets, but, um, you know, somebody asked me one time, why we were so successful and I, I said well a lot of luck and we had more to shoot at so that's what I tell them. <laughs> okay. um, did you have any idea that you'd be getting any backup were there troops on the way did you have any communication with the outside that that gave you a sense that well we could retake the city but it's going to be able to run again or or you know there are more troops that, that we can call upon Okay. We were about halfway through the the, the battle to, to take back Chow Duck when I realized that we weren't going to get any backup. Initially, I kept thinking we're going to get some relief. Uh, there was a um, uh, an advisory unit outside of town and in in outside of Chow Duck in a place called Tin Bin, they tried to get to us. Tin Bin was the only district that wasn't really hit and they tried to get to us. Uh, the enemy had blown the bridges. There was two roads into Chow Duck other than the river system, but they had mined the, the road to the south and the one to Tin Bin they had blown the bridge. 
and uh, the American advisor that was trying to, to rescue us, he, he knew of us. Uh, in fact, I had given him a 50 caliber machine gun. Uh, I, I saw a glimpse of his vehicle and they were ambushed trying to come in when they got around the blown out bridge and he was killed. Um, so other than that, I didn't think we were going to get any reinforcement because by then Jim had been on the radio and said the, that it appears that there's a major offensive in every capital, the 44 capitals in uh, provincial capitals in Vietnam. And uh, so there were no, no hope for reinforcements. Um, we did need ammunition resupply. Uh, we got some air, airdrop of a um, uh, caribou, uh, uh, Air America airdropped some supplies uh, to us. So our only reinforcement was, was kind of meager attempt. But we're talking about a siege and, and, you know, once you decide you aren't going to get anybody you, to help, you're going to do what you have to do with what you have. And um, when we pursued, uh, the indigenous and I, and my troops, pursued taking over some of the key places, we ran into, we were able to capture, I captured 20 prisoners, and one of them was very high ranking individual that was uh, designated to be, in translation, president of Chow Duck City or province. And we didn't know that, he just kind of looked important. We got him back to the embassy house and that's when he was identified by one of my, one of our, uh, our people, our indigenous people, that we had captured earlier, who was a high-ranking individual and recognized it. At that time, uh, I'm thinking, well, if there's a major offensive, we'll call in uh, transportation to get him out. If we've got somebody equivalent to be a general officer, uh, we'll find out what the major uh, uh, objective was for the entire country. So uh, Jim called to our next higher headquarters and told them we had somebody we believe was a general level officer, and they sent a um, Air America Pilatus Porter and landed on the road south of the Chow Duck and uh, sent him out to interrogate him. We knew then that uh, it was a major offensive, no help was coming, and not until after about uh, 50 some hours did, uh, when Canto itself uh, had uh, was successful in uh, defeating the enemy down there. Did they send a, an Arvin unit up and start to clear the, the few pockets of enemy that remained in the city after we had taken it back? There really weren't many BC left. They had, we're, Chow Duck was only a few hundred meters from the Cambodian border. And so while we, we were able to uh, uh, eliminate an awful lot of them that decide to stay and fight, uh, a lot of them were able to escape and uh, cross back into the border. When the Arvin unit came up and, and they, they uh, started clearing the town like a classic conventional operation, they just called in airstrikes and everything and uh, helicopters and, and that's when uh, a lot of the damage to the city occurred was when fires started and, and from their close air support. Um, so that's it. Do you consider yourself a hero? I don't consider myself a hero at all. Um, I was a professional soldier and you do what you have to do. And I believe that, um, and I've seen it many times, individuals doing, doing what, is, what is necessary. You know, an American soldier is the only, I've been around the world in a lot of places and without exception, American soldier or America puts together somebody that's willing to, to make sacrifices for those on their left and their right. And you, you're willing to do that because you know they're doing it for you. And so you don't consider yourself special. 
You just did a, a job that had to be done. We were just very successful, very lucky, um, and just doing what we had to do. Um, when did you first hear that you would be receiving the Medal of Honor? I first heard that I might be receiving some an award um, when um, some of the Navy SEALs were writing affidavits and, and that sort of thing, which was a little unusual because the project I was in, we didn't get any awards because there was no, uh, no structure for that. I was working with the Central Intelligence Agency. Quite frankly, uh, I was the only American on the things that I did before, so there's no witnesses, no American eyewitnesses. If it hadn't have been for the SEALs and some of the other Americans, nobody would have uh, probably recognized what, what, I, what we were, I was able to accomplish. Um, when, when I first, I didn't know that I was going to receive a Medal of Honor. I thought it was some other decoration, possibly. Uh, there was some talk about a Medal of Honor. Uh, but because there was a lot of little different actions, there was talk about different awards for the different actions. But then somebody, I guess, decided to, uh, to investigate further, and they sent a general officer up, retired general officer, to, to collect uh, information. I was aware of that. I didn't stop what I was doing. I kept going out on patrols and stuff. I came back to Fort Bragg in the Special Forces, and I was in my first day of Arabic language school when the um, uh, first the first briefing of what the class was going to be about, the door opened in the back of, of our little classroom and I recognized two of my teammates that weren't in the class and they had come to tell the instructor that I had the meeting with the uh, group commander and then he's the one that's told me I'd be going to Washington in about three days very short notice to receive the Medal of Honor. And that was, I have to admit, that was quite a shock. Uh, what were you feeling? About that? Yeah. Initially, I wasn't sure what it was for. You know, what, the, what action it was for. Um, there was, uh, when uh, another operation I was on, some American captain said he was gonna put me in for something. He just did that as I put him on a litter going up to the helicopter. I'd ran into him on a, I was on with my troops and he was in a, advising some Arvin units and got in a bad situation and I was able to get him out. And he said something about it and I, and I didn't know. Um, so went to Washington in three days and I couldn't put together, I couldn't even have some of my friends there. It was because it was the last thing that President Johnson was going to do before he left office in two days. They wanted it to be, he wanted to do it. And so we didn't have a lot of time. So um, tell me about the ceremony itself. Did you, did you have, who was, who was attending? And, um, yeah, the Medal of Honor ceremony was just something incredible. You can imagine a staff sergeant. Very, very, I was a young staff sergeant extremely proud to be in Special Forces, that I, I uh, totally admired the non-commissioner officers that taught me everything I knew. And uh, so I was very humiliated to be recognized by being something special when I thought I put all those people up here, you know. And the ceremony was an incredible ceremony. Because it was the last one of President Johnson, it was a joint ceremony. They had an Army, Navy, Air Force, um, and a Marine. The other three were aviators. Um, ceremony, and there were about 400 people in the East Room of the, the White House, all the, the chairman and all, uh, General Westmoreland, um, all of the, the the chief of staffs so of the respective services were there. My family was there. It would have been nice to know where Maggie was and Jim Monroe but at the time, but it was such short notice, it just no, no way to get anybody together. Um, and because of the joint ceremony, they limited how many people we could have there because of the four services being represented. 
Do you remember, <coughs> excuse me, do you remember anything that President Johnson said to you? President Johnson, uh, interesting individual. Uh, I was in the restroom just before the East Room getting ready to go in, and he came in. <laughs> so we talked briefly. I don't, I, just briefly about what guys talk about, you know. <laughs> he was an interesting guy, uh, man. And, uh, and then he walked out, he secret, his, his Secret Service were with him. And then, uh, and then because of the, the other individuals were aviators, there were three officers. And, uh, and I was a staff sergeant, so you do it in order of ranks, right? So I was the last one. And uh, so they read the citation, and he leaned over and whispered something in, in my, my ear. And I won't repeat it, but uh, it was very personal, and it was very, uh, it's almost like he knew what it would have been like. And, uh, but he, he, in fact, there's a photograph of him leaning over and whispering something there. In the, middle, in the middle of this ceremony. And I first thing I thought of, I wonder if everybody could hear that. <laughs> so I won't repeat it. Quite a character, huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, what does the Medal of Honor mean to you? The Medal of Honor is a very, very special, has a very special meaning to me. You can imagine what it's like to be a young young person wanting to do a good job and being recognized by your service, your, your country. And then to, to receive that recognition and to go home and receive acknowledgement from your hometown, it, it's, just, it's just something that you can't really explain. But those of us that wear the Medal of Honor know that that there are so many other soldiers, airmen, marines that have done acts that, that just weren't recognized that, because there were no witnesses left. So I'm very proud to be able to wear the Medal of Honor for all of those that, that performed deeds far greater than I did, that, that no one, no human being knows what they did. They survived and they didn't let their buddy down on their left and their right. And that is, that's uh, an honor that, that, uh, that I'll have until I no longer wear it. How has it changed your life? The Medal of Honor uh, has changed our, my life. It, like everyone that has the Medal of Honor, it does. It, to say it doesn't, is, it, it'd be foolish. Uh, as a staff sergeant, first of all, I got a direct commission as an officer. Um, I'm a staff sergeant and I wanted to be a, a special forces soldier and then I'm asked to speak at different events and do things. Uh, and they asked me about world politics, world situations. I mean, I'm the same person I was before and what makes me an expert on any of those? Um, it was tough to stay in special forces because people knew who I was and there was some missions I couldn't go on or train for. I resented that a lot. They, the, I, I wanted to go on the Sante raid, uh, but they, because of the, the secrecy of it, I, and when they were interviewing, I knew it was some, I, they were told later that's why they didn't let me go on it, uh, to train for it. That's an example. So you, you can't do things, because they said, well, what if you get killed or captured? And I'm thinking, yeah, what if uh, anybody gets killed or captured? And then, then I'm back in the United States. The Vietnam War is just ongoing. I'm now a commissioned officer, infantry officer, that has one mission, and that's to lead American soldiers in battle if there's a war. And so everybody asks me what it's like to, uh, to, to lead American soldiers. Well, I didn't. First of all, I led indigenous soldiers. Second of all, I'm a captain, there's a war going on. So I went to uh, this general officer I know that has a lot of power, a new General Westmoreland, and he, they allowed me to go back. 
I went back to Vietnam as a company commander in the 101st. I found out later that the troops had heard about me. The young troops are draftees and are worried that, I, that I'm going to get them all killed because of, you know, we're going into, you know, aggressive or whatever. And uh, so I had to overcome that. And then, and then, um, I find out in the middle of the night, after I'm there about um, two or three weeks, we're on combat operations. Middle of the night, I hear somebody on a radio in, in my command, you know, or my command center is just clearing in the, in the jungle, but I hear my radio operator on there and I crawl over there and I go, who are you talking to? He wouldn't answer me. Well, in the middle of the night, I got a little irate. I thought, I'm thinking maybe he's a spy or, <laughs> or whatever. He's talking on the radio. And then finally, he says, well, I just had to call headquarters to let them know that you're okay. And I'm thinking, what? And he says, yeah, I've had to do this every day. And so first of all, you're, you're telling your soldiers that the only one anybody's concerned about with is their company commander. I said, from this day on, you're not making a phone call. And I called the battalion commander, got me off their so-called watch list. And so that's, that's how it affected. It was hard to, to do the, the job after receiving this Medal of Honor. Now, um, do, you, do you now speak to um, kids about Uh, I speak to uh, groups fairly often about uh, uh, character, uh, about patriotism, about what it's, what their duty is that they need to serve, not necessarily the military, but serve the country. It's not a free ride, and and I, I talk to them about once a month somewhere. Uh, what, and do you, what do you say to them? What I, I say to the, the young people, the, the students, that, that there isn't, nothing's free. You've got to earn it. You've got to do what's right. And I kind of relate myself uh, to them because I'm, I'm old to them. I mean, you know, 50s in their 50s to someone that's... Uh, in maybe 8, 10, 12, 15, 16, 17 years old is, is they're going to listen, here's an old guy that doesn't know anything, but, but I tell them that I went in the Army at 17, and I tell them why I went in, that I had people I respected, that I felt an obligation. I never tell them in a way that, that I'm better than they are, that this is just the way it was. There was no reason for it. I did, no one told me I needed to do it, I just wanted to do it. And I tell them that, that in anything they do, whether it's in the military and you have a military uh, commitment or whether it's in the in private sector or in school, you can't let, you don't let your, your buddies on the left and the right down. You just do what's right and they'll do it for you and that's what makes this country so great. So hopefully, if I can leave a thought with just one of them every time I do it, it's worth it. And I, and I feel like I do because um, I get letters back from young people. And, and I'm going to speak to um, an Eagle Scout banquet in Juneau, Alaska next month. And uh, the theme is Character Counts. And I, I want to talk about character because everybody has character, whether it's good or bad. It's not what you judge your characters, how other people judge you. And I'm very careful not to uh, say you have to be like me because you don't want to come across that way. You need to say that because they're, they're in, being influenced by family or whoever they're around now. And you just need to say, this is how it was. This is my good times and my bad times. And I'm doing okay now. And you can do okay too. So. Talk to me about leadership. Well, how important is that in, in the context of uh, when we're gathering troops together and 
and taking control? Leadership. Um, there are leaders, there are people that are assigned to be a leader by the virtue of their rank or their position, whether the military or civilian. And then there's a situation that allows you to, to, to be the leader. Uh, it may not be that uh, no one else knows what to do. It's just that they know that at the time you, you know what to do at this particular time. When I was putting people together for this mission and uh, to take back Chow Duck, um, well, nobody knew what rank I was anyway. I was a civilian. Uh, I guess it's a little bit of heartburn that they found out I was a staff sergeant and there was an officer, two officers there, one of them in command of the other one. But um, they relinquished it to me. Uh, but they thought I would outrank them. So, <laughs> but uh, I clearly knew where to go, and I felt like I knew knew the enemy. After all, uh, I was in in charge of that indigenous unit. Uh, you're talking about the the action. Yeah. Yeah. No. It, it was. I mean, you you obviously and, and a lot of the recipients said. If it wasn't me, it couldn't have been anybody else at that time in that particular place. And you just kind of got a sense that you knew it? Leadership at the time is, is, a, is a sense that everyone gets, I'm sure, in a certain situation, especially a bad one. And if, and if you feel that you can do it, you're going to do it. Because in, in war, especially the outcome, you're that close to die in or your, your unit is, is, is that close to failure and you've got to move. The enemy has leadership too and you hope they make their leaders make some mistakes and you don't want to make any before they do. Um, is there anything that I should have asked you that I haven't about the medal or about the action? Uh, I don't. I, I guess um, the only thing I wanted to get across is that um, the indigenous troops um, did did a superb job, you know, and and I, I probably should say something about that. Well, tell me a little bit about um, those that you worked with on, on that, and uh, you know what they meant to you. My my job in Vietnam was to lead, train, and organize an indigenous unit. Uh, I had some of the finest soldiers, indigenous soldiers that you could imagine. Uh, they were, they would do anything for me, I felt. They were there for the long haul. I was there probably for a year. I tried to stay longer, but it wouldn't let me, and I should have known that maybe I had a date at the White House or something, but I didn't know, and I, th I thought I did a good job, but they wouldn't let me stay. Um, but my soldiers were, I felt like I let them down after being gone just for, being there just for a year because they were going to be there till the war was won or lost. And when they, when I was, we were in that battle and things didn't look real good and they risked their lives for me and they know I'm going in a year and they're going to be there until they die or the war's over. Uh, that was a, a good. That was a turning point in my my uh, feelings for them. We we were very close, and I feel that the indigenous uh, troops in Vietnam never got the the, the fair shake. Uh, a lot of the criticisms about the Vietnam War was directed to the leadership, the Vietnamese leadership. Um, if their leadership went bad, it was probably because we let the world go on so long, gave them opportunities to, to do whatever they were doing or not do it. But the soldiers, the ones that were drafted or re-recruited, the young soldiers, uh, they were superb. They would do anything. And they did for me. And they deserve an awful lot of credit. And if they weren't around, if they hadn't have been around then, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. And that's kind of what I want to get across. Okay. That ought to do it. Great job.